You know what, guys? Let me just get into the word here for a little bit here. Uh, but Merry Christmas, Eve, 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 Eve. I think it's like 20 days. How many days till Christmas? Any Christmas people? 14 days is what I heard. 15 days, somebody. <laughs> you guys might be in different time zones. But, um, um, uh, boy, we're in this series called I Hate the Christmas. And I hate the Christmas. I hate the holidays. And uh, sometimes the holidays can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, strange family relationships, increased traffic, whatever it is, stress, financial stress. It could be, uh, it could be a challenge. But uh, here's what Dr. Seuss said about the Grinch. He said, the Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. Do you guys know it? He has a small heart, so a small capacity to, to, uh, to love. And, and in this particular scene that you just saw, um, just stay with me, guys. We're going to get into the message here. In this particular scene that we just saw, you saw the origin of his meanness. This mayor of Whoville had been bullying him and thought it was fun, and continued. And then you see these other kids in the classroom start to bully him, make fun of him, that kind of thing. And he becomes cold-hearted, unforgiving, and diabolical. So as we look at this, I want you to remember that all of us have a story. All of us have memories of pain and pleasure. All of us have been in relationships where we've been offended, We've been hurt. You have, may have been the one who has offended someone. I, I have done that before unintentionally, and maybe intentionally at times, being honest. Whatever the case is, all of us come to the table right now, whatever age you are, and we have memories, and sometimes the past kind of comes out. And how do you love people who have that kind of story? How do you love people who aren't as far along as you hope they would be, and, and the past kind of bubbles up inside of them, and you're called to love them, and it's a challenge at times, how do you do that? It matters to God. So that's what we're talking about today. Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace and your love, and thank you for uh, meeting with us even during our time of worship. And I thank you by faith, God, for healing those people who came forward Thank you, Lord. Bless them for their, for their faith steps, Lord. Bless them. And Lord, we, uh, we just need you. We need your word. We need your Holy Spirit. We need your presence, God. If there's something weighing on your heart, could you give it to God right now? Just say, God, I'm going to give this to you. Or maybe it's your giant. I'm going to give this to you, God. I need you to do a miracle. I need you to help me. I'm going to stop carrying this. I'm going to stop worrying. I'm going to stop overthinking. I'm going to give it to you, Lord. So God, work in every home. Work with every man and woman, young and old, single, married, wherever we're at in our life. Would you minister to each one of us? And I pray that we all have an encounter with your word during this time. Holy Spirit, work in me and through me. I care. I care about your anointing more than anything else, God. Continue to work in my heart and my mind. Make me eloquent. Give me the words to say. And may I just be a spokesman, a clean vessel for you, God. Use me in a way that's disproportionate to who I am. And may you, Jesus, be glorified in every heart. In your name we pray all this. Amen. Amen. I could have kept going for a little bit, guys. Hey, we have our Christmas Eve services coming up. How many of you are planning on being at the Christmas Eve services? God bless you. It's going to be online as well. If you're planning on traveling, cancel your travel plans and uh, come to Christmas Eve service at Thorn Creek Church. It'll be good. But uh, we go all out for Christmas Eve services. The reason why we go all out is because we care about the spiritually lost. And Christmas Eve is the biggest evangelistic weekend or event all year. People who don't go to church regularly or at all 
they'll come to a Christmas Eve service. There's something about the tradition of I'm, I should, probably should go to church because I think Christmas is involving the birth of Jesus. You know, So they go to church, which is great, and they show up, and then we'll talk to them about the love of God. Uh, this year, the theme is broken ornaments. We're going to have a rage room with broken ornaments. That's going to be, that's another, that's going to be fun. But uh, we're going to have broken ornaments, and we're looking at how God worked with broken people, and he healed broken people throughout Scripture. That's what we're looking at. So if you know someone who's broken, bring them to church. Here's what we're asking you to do. We have six services for you to choose from. They're all identical. We have a lot of volunteers who are just pouring themselves into this, and God bless you if you're one of those. But we want you to come to one service, and the other service, with the other service there up there, you might want to take a picture or something. The other service, we want, we need your help volunteering. So there's a QR code right in front of you. If you reached out your hand, you can and probably touch it. Would you take a picture of that QR code and, uh, and let us know what service you're willing to serve in. We need volunteers, guys. So if you're one of these people that's like, I'll think about it, and you're not going to tell us till Christmas Eve, please don't do that to us. Would you tell us now? It'll help us with stress as we are trying to give our best so that we could love on people. So please don't procrastinate. There's something for you to do. So uh, take a picture of that QR code and, and fill it out and, uh, and, uh, and um, let us know you can help. Have you ever been offended? Raise your hand if you've ever been offended. Um, have you ever been the offender? Have you ever been the offender? It requires a little humility, that question. I have. I have. We live in an era of offense. Have you ever thought about posting something and then thought, well, if I post this, it might offend someone, so I better not post it, and I'm going to keep my comments to myself, or I'm going to keep this. Because the reason behind that is because people get offended Pretty easily, pretty easily. Um, uh, whether you're white, black, brown, whatever, you can get or poor, rich, doesn't matter. Um, you, you can get offended pretty easily. Um, I could post two plus two equals four, and I bet there's someone that's going to be offended with that. Someone's going to say not necessarily true or whatever. It's, it, we just live in this, in this era of offense. And, and here's what I want to say. How you manage the offenses in your life determines the outcome of your life. How you manage the offenses in your life determines the outcome of your life. We live in a world with fallen people, in a fallen world, spiritually speaking. And because of that, you have this thing called sinful nature that runs in the veins of everyone. You have this thing called the flesh, the battle of the flesh and the spirit. And you have people who sometimes who call themselves Christian that aren't very Christian. You have people who don't know God that do things that are hurtful. And we have everything in between. So you're in a situation, if you're in a relationship, you'll discover it. You'll discover it. Um, I thought about difficult people, and I want to give you seven difficult people that are hard to be in a relationship with. So uh, here's, yeah, here's, here's, here's the first difficult person, and maybe you've met them, the passive aggressive. Have you ever heard of the passive aggressive? A passive aggressive person is very common. They'll appear to comply with the needs of others. They'll appear to comply with whatever your thoughts are, but they secretly don't. They, they, they are not really with you, even though you think they're with you, and they might resist passively in other ways. Or the chronic complainer, their fault finding, blame, blame finding, and they, they find wrong in everything and everyone. Or the know-it-all, this is someone who feels sure they know more than you and everyone else. They have a low tolerance for correction, the know-it-all. The narcissist, this person is focused on themselves and only themselves. They need constant praise, attention, admiration. If you don't give them attention when they want attention, they get angry. They have a sense of entitlement and very little empathy. Or the controller, they want to control everything and everyone. In the house, out of the house, it doesn't matter. 
they like to control. Or the victim. This person doesn't take accountability for their actions or words. They blame others. It's your fault, and he forgot, and she forgot, and they did this, and my, it's my parents' fault, and it's the teacher's fault, and it's the coach's fault, and it's the hamster's fault, whatever. The negativity spreader. This is someone who does not, who's not content with just having negative feelings. They want to spread those negative feelings. They're negative, and that's just who they are. They're negative about people, events, projects, work, school, church, whatever. They're negative about everything. Um, how do you love some a difficult person? How do you do that? Um, last weekend, I shared out of Philippians chapter 4. You can go to YouTube and listen to the whole service. It was about contentment. Um, but in there, verses 2 and 3, I, I passed over a couple of ladies. And I thought about this this week as I was preparing for this message and I was seeking God's will. And the Lord took me back to these two verses, and I want to read them to you. Um, I'm going I'm to eventually share with you five don'ts in a relationship. But uh, before we get to that, I'm going to ramp up to here. But Philippians chapter 4, Paul the Apostle says, Now I appeal to Yodia and Sintiji, please, because you belong to the Lord. Say, because you belong to the Lord. Can you say that out loud? Because you belong to the Lord. And then what does Paul say? Settle. So we don't know what happened with Yodia and Sintiji. These are two women. Two women in the church. And something happened. Something happened. And it's well known. Paul, when he wrote this letter to the churches in, in Philippi, he was in prison. So he's in a prison cell and he heard about the rumor of Yodia and Sintiji. And then verse 3 says, And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. Well, that tells you a little bit about their history. They worked hard with Paul in ministry. And ironically, telling people about Jesus, telling people about the love of God, telling people about the mercy of God, the grace of God. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are written in the book of life. So these two women are called out from Paul's cell. He writes them down on this letter. And whatever it is that happened, it's well known. And maybe the church knows. Maybe the church knows. And the church knows, hey, I know these two ladies, Yodi and Sintiji, are not getting along. So if we invite Yodia to the house, we better not invite Sintiji. You know, whose side are you on? Which one are you on? Yodia's or Sintiji? Which team are you on? What, 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 what side are you going to take? And everybody in the church knew it. Now, it's a big deal that Paul the Apostle, you see his boldness. He cares about the unity of the church. And, and he says, hey, make sure Yodia and Sintiji, you know, because they belong to the Lord, you need to help them out. Tell them to settle this disagreement. Now, that's a big deal. Let me just turn this a little bit. Let me turn this to a little. We like to keep matters private, right? We live behind our automatic garage doors. We don't, maybe not, don't share with anything. And you may even have lines for the pastor. The pastor can say this, but he better not say this. And if I don't like what the pastor says, I'm not going to come back. If I don't like what the pastor says, I'm not going to give. Whatever it is. But how would you feel if you had a relationship with someone or, or, or some sort of conflict with someone in the church, and I'm up here on stage, and I publicly say your name, and I say you, and you need to settle the disagreement because you belong to the Lord. You'd be offended, a lot of you. I can't believe he said my name from there. I can't believe he did that. Would you come to church next week? Yeah, probably not. Most of us. Probably not. Probably not. But Paul the Apostle, one thing you see about Christianity during these days, I'm going to say it like this. They ain't playing any games. It's like either you're pregnant or you're not. Either Jesus is your Lord or, you're, or he's not. Because during these days, if you were a Christian, you could very well lose your life. You couldn't, no, no one wanted to go through the motions. That's like a whole other message. The thing that the Lord showed me 
with Yodia and Sintichi. It's like, what happened? I think, you know, we know they served together. Maybe they went on, you know, different, went down the street knocking on doors, or maybe they were on a street corner. Maybe they were discipling people. I think they occasionally, now this is speculation, but I think it's a safe speculation. I think they occasionally ate together. Maybe, maybe they just hung out together at the, at the kitchen. Maybe they, I, I, it's another speculated thing. I think they laughed together. I think, I mean, they, were, they had a relationship. They were friends. I think they shared some transparent things with each other. And the thing that the Lord showed me is they had an emotional bond. And let me say this. To be emotionally bonded means that you feel securely attached or connected to another person you know cares for you. Emotional bonds are strong. And they happen all the time. There's emotional bonds in this room. You have emotional bonds with someone. Sometimes it's because you're related to that person. Maybe it's a mother or father or child or brother or sister. Sometimes that's the case. But if it's not blood, here's what emotional bonds look like. Let's pretend a woman invites another woman to her house. She shows up and looks around and says, man. And then the woman in the house says, gosh, I'm so sorry. My house is so messy. And then the other woman says, oh, no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. I understand. My house is messy, too. How can I help? Bam. Emotional bond. Am I right, ladies? Emotional bond right there. You care about me. Or a dude. You're working on a project or something happens in the house and a pipe breaks and it's never a good time for a pipe to break or you get a flat tire or whatever it is. And there's some other dude that that sees what's happening and says, nope, 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 nope. I can help out with that and I'll be there in 10 minutes. Right here. Right here. You try to pay them, they say, nope. Nope. Right here. You know what I'm talking about? Those are emotional bonds. Let me help you out with your kids. I'm going to bring groceries to you. I'll help you with your project. You've got, I, I, or the other emotional one that happens is when you simply have a conversation with someone and you share something incredibly transparent and vulnerable with them. It's like you entrust them with pearls and you give them to them and they handle them well. Emotional bond. You get that? So there, there's Blessing and cursings with emotional bonds. And what I've discovered as a pastor is I don't have that same relationship with everyone in the church. We have close to a thousand people that call this their home church. And I can't be in every kitchen. I can't show up and do all those things. And God has called me to do this. And I try to do it well by the grace of God. But I don't have those kinds of relationships. The other thing I've, I've discovered about emotional bonds is when you have an emotional bond with someone, there's such a deep care for them, a deep love for them, a deep connection for them, at times you will just err on their side. You'll just believe them. You care about them. You think the best of them. And if it's a, if it's a competition between them and someone that you don't have an emotional bond with, guess who wins? The emotional bond. But put it this way, when it comes to social media, when someone posts and you have an emotional bond with them, and they post on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is, they post something that they're going through. Maybe they lost something or they lost someone or whatever. They lost a, a job or, or they lost whatever. And they post it and look at, all, look at the thread on all the posts of all these people who have emotional bonds. And you know what they're saying? Poor you. I can't believe this is happening to you. You don't deserve this. I can't believe. That's all you see. Rarely do you ever see someone say something like, yeah, you should have been at, been at work and not, 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 not show up late all the time. Maybe it would have been different. Yeah, you should have showed up. Yeah, you should. You, nobody does that. Nobody does that. It's because it's the power of emotional bonds. Emotional bonds. Uh, there was a study done by uh, Christian Bootner. She's a doctoral student in social psychology at the University of Basel in Switzerland. And she studies exclusion, specifically the psychological effects of social media ostracism. And what that is, is let's pretend, you know, let's pretend you're hanging out with some friends, think you're having a good old time. Maybe you're talking at church, I don't know. And then they say, hey, we should go out and do this again. 
We should go to a restaurant and we should go hang out. Yeah, we want to go to Papados. Yeah, a little name drop, but you know I love Papados. Let's go to Papados together. Yeah, that'll be fun. Oh, that's cool. And you're excited about it. And you're waiting for the phone call. And nobody calls you. And then one day you're looking at Facebook and there they are. They're all at Papados. And you're at home. Have you been there before? And you're like, well, you know, social media can be hurtful at times. Right? Social media could be hurtful. So here's what she said, this woman. She said, if you put someone in a brain scanner and make them feel excluded, and you look at their brain, the same area lights up that lights up when people feel physical pain. Isn't that interesting? Same area. However, research has found that people relive social pain over and over again, and social pain is enduring. Some of you are medical people and you know this already. But, but what she's saying is the body, the brain, cannot determine physical, the difference between physical pain and relational pain. Hurt. Relational hurt. In other words, emotional pain hurts longer than physical pain. That's what she's saying. So it'll take longer for you to get over a relationship that you had a bond with where you experienced hurt. It'll take longer for you to get over that pain than your broken elbow. Your broken elbow will heal quicker. It'll heal quicker. And that's why, that's why we carry hurt with us longer than we should. That's why when we've experienced hurt, we're like, you know what, I'm not gonna trust anyone again. There's people that aren't in churches right now because they experienced hurt by a Christian, by a church, by a pastor, whatever, and they've said, I'm not going to go to church. I was at a store recently, and, and when I was, I'm going to be general, when I was at the store, the, the, the guy that came forward, I, I recognized him, and um, he never has come to Thorn Creek, and that's, that's fine. He goes to another church, but I know a little bit about him from his pastor, so I said, hey, how's it going, man? Thank you for helping me out. I appreciate it. And, and how are things going with Pastor so-and-so and your church? How are things going? And he got really quiet. And I could tell just by looking at his eyes, he's been drifting. I could see the windows of his souls. And I can see he's just spiritually drifting, and he's on a journey on his own. That's what I saw. He's not closer to God. He's farther away from God. I looked it in his eyes, and I saw it. And then he gets quiet and he says, you know, I don't go to church anymore. I said, what do you mean? I said, didn't you serve? Like you were helping out with, and I rattled off a whole bunch of ministries that he was helping out with. And you were like in it, man. It was like ride or die. What happened? And he goes, yeah, just working through my own stuff. And I don't know. I'm not, I'm not in it. And I tell him, well, God loves you. I said, you need to get back to your church. Go back to your church. Yeah, he says, you know, I grew up Christian. I even went to Bible college and all that stuff. And I just have experienced stuff and, and that was it. And then another customer came in and we had to stop our conversation. But I got in my Sarah and I called up my pastor friend and I said, hey man, I just ran into so-and-so. And he got quiet. He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, pray for that dude. He has experienced so much hurt growing up. And it's all bubbling up now. He said, it's all surfacing now. So he was aware of it. Beautiful pastor. And he thanked me for encouraging him to get back to church. But I just thought, you know, the other thing behind this, I thought, you know, sometimes when we're hurt, we think, it, we think about ourselves only. How it's hurt us. But rarely do we think how we respond to this offense could potentially affect another soul. You hear that? How we respond to that offense. If you could just think outside of your narcissistic box and how you respond to the wrong could potentially put that soul on a new trajectory. I think we're all aware that we're under construction, aren't we? I mean, you're aware you're not perfect, right? Turn to the person next to you and just say, you know you're not perfect, right? Can you just say that? 
<laughs> I know some of you are like, I'm not perfect, but I'm pretty close. <laughs> you know who you are. No, you're not. Turn back to them and say, no, you're not. Can you just do that? <laughs> no, you're not. So if that's the case, here's the truth. We need the grace of God all the time. We need the grace of God all the time. Let me just tell you guys the way I feel. I feel like I need the grace of God more than any of you. I'm concerned about God's anointing and God's favor over my life. I, I, that, that drives everything for me. That drives everything for me. Um, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you. So you must love one another. This, you just stop right there. Jesus said, I want you to love one another as he has loved you. So it's not love based on your version. It's not love with strings attached. It's not love with contingencies. The cross is the standard. It was sacrificial love. It's agape love. It's love that took him to the place where he carried the weight of the sins of the world. And he suffered and bled out and died for us. Literally died. That's love. And you see this love in the life of Jesus over and over and over. People look at him and say, why are you eating and drinking with those people? Why aren't you picking up a rock and throwing it to her? Why are you talking to that girl at the well? What are you doing? What are you doing hanging out with him? Don't you know who he is? And you see the love of Jesus over and over and over. And he's giving this new framework to the love of God. All souls belong to God. Your soul belongs to God. Every soul belongs to God. And scripture says he doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to go to heaven. That's the heart of God. And this is the kind of love. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Verse 35. By this everyone will know by this Say by this with me. Everyone will know, what? That you are my disciples. What? If, if you love one another. So first he says, love one another like I've loved you. And then Jesus says, by this. Say by this one more time. By this. Wow. So you have this love from heaven that's transformational. But it doesn't, it's not supposed to stay inside of you, like just like bottled up. Like God wants this love to leak out of your life. And he wants you to love others just like he has loved you. And by this, people will know who lives inside of you. By this, people will know. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior. By this, people will know. The way you love. Wow. The way you love. The way you love. You know what else Jesus is saying? Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Now, let me say it this way. It matters to God how you treat others. Husbands. It matters to God how you treat your wife. Wives, it matters to God how you treat your husband. Boyfriend, girlfriend, it matters to God how you treat them. Brother, sister, it matters to God how you treat your siblings. Kids, it matters to God how you treat your parents. And we all have parents. You never grow out of it. It matters to God. It matters to God how you treat the stranger. 
It matters to God how you treat that person at Chipotle. It matters to God how you treat that person at King Supers. It matters to God how you treat that stranger on the phone. It matters to God how you treat how you treat that solicitor that shows up to your door even though you have no soliciting on your door. It matters to God how you treat that cleaning lady, how you treat that janitor, how you treat it matters to God how you treat others. In fact, so much so, at another place, check this out, it says, hey, if you're not treating others the way God wants you to treat them, it could actually affect your prayer life, and God will not hear your prayers. That's what it says. So it matters to God how you treat others. And I know some of us like to compartmentalize a little bit, and we're like, you know what? I love you, God, but not so much that Grinch. And we can convince ourselves, you know what? The blood of Jesus covers me, and he's forgiven me for all of my sins, and he's such a good God, and the worst he has forgiven. But I'm going to hold a grudge against them. Wouldn't it be cool if you extended that same grace and love that you have for yourself and put it over them and say, you know what? God loves them too. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Here's the danger. We have the capacity to manipulate our image of God into something that is less demanding of ourselves. You know what I'm talking about? God is love. You read First John chapter 4. God is love. And we can look at God and say, you know what, God? I, I recognize you are the creator of the universe and the creator of the world. And I believe, God, that you sent your son into this world 2,000 years ago. And by faith, I put my trust in him. And I believe he's risen. I believe the grave is empty. I believe all of those things. And I believe, I believe you've ex- I've experienced the forgiveness of our sins. But um, when it comes to my horizontal relationships, you know what I've been through, God. You understand. You know what happened. You know my heart. You know why I won't forgive. You know why I'm carrying this grudge. And the deeper the hurt, the longer it takes. But I've, I've never seen, I've never seen a hurt or a wound that gets buried, heal. Never seen that. Now, I, I do believe if there's some sort of abuse or, you know, sexual abuse and that level of hurt, I do believe in being wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove and and making sure you're safe. I wholeheartedly believe that. But many times, that's not the case. It's just, they're just a grudge. I just don't like them. Or I'm going to hold a grudge. I'm going to hold a grudge. Let me share with you the five don'ts. This is Leviticus chapter 19. And uh, the five don'ts. Um, the, the, I think we have a picture of a boxing. Do we have, is this where the boxing ring is at? I'm confused. Okay. Um, um, I, I wanted this picture up because I think this is kind of how it feels sometimes in relationships. Where you're like, okay, I just got, you know, I, got, I just got punched in the face. And how am I going to respond? You know, I just, got, I, just, I just got a body blow. How am I going to respond to this? And I'm going to give you these five don'ts in Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19 are known as the sundry, S-U-N-D-R-Y, the sundry laws. And, and they're called that because they have to do with relationships. And they're so practical in these few verses. They're so practical. And that's why I wanted to bring them up to the surface so we can love better. Um, verse 16 says, do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Pretty simple. So the first don't is this. Don't slander others. What slander? The action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. This is like a sin. Scripture talks about slander over and over and over again. Don't slander others. Don't slander others. When you talk about someone's character in a critical way behind their back, you're hurting the name. You're hurting the name. It's not good 
What you're doing is you're trying to win that other person over so they can be equally angry with you. When we're angry and hurt, we look for people to agree with us. Do you know why? Because it validates our anger and hurt. And we need that. It makes you feel better. So you're like, here, I drank this poison. Taste it. Taste this poison with me. I want you to be equally angry with me. Slander is horrible. The devil loves slander. Do you know why? Because it creates division. <clears throat> I, I told Pastor Jeremy this week, I have a love-hate relationship for small groups. You know what I'm talking about? I have a love-hate relationship. And some of you have been in the church long enough, you know exactly where I'm going. Because there are some groups, when they're healthy and they're positive, and they're supportive of the church. They're beautiful. And you develop emotional bonds in there. And it's a wonderful thing. You have refrigerator rights when you show up. And you can call them whenever you're going through a hard time. You talk to them through the week. And it's a great, great thing. Those are good small groups. We're focused on God's word. We're praying for church leadership. We're doing all those things. But there's another type of small group that occasionally rears its ugly head. You know what I'm talking about. It's when slander's involved. And they start talking about church staff, or they start talking about other people in the church, or other leaders in the church. And then it little, it's just like cancer, it starts to spread. And you know what that creates? Division. The devil wants division. Uh, you know what else I thought of? Now, I don't know, I have never seen any research on this, but just based on my experience as a pastor in 30 years... And I'm just going to say this. I wonder how many new churches were started because of a slanderous small group. Lord, help us. It hurts. It's ironic, too, this whole thing, because the essence of Christianity is to die to yourself. Isn't that the essence of Christianity? To die to yourself? But when you slander others, it hurts them. It hurts them. Um, Proverbs, or excuse me, Psalm chapter 7. We're not going to read it. I <laughs> just told you that. It. But it's, uh, it's King David. And King David talks about his life <clears throat> as he's been slandered, falsely accused, um, attacked, uh, his relationship with him. It's amazing. Psalm chapter 7. And I encourage you to look at it because I look at King David and I'm like, when I looked at him, as I, as I, as I thought about him, I thought he spent his whole life and almost his whole life. I don't know where, where it ended. I mean, I think he was better off with the sheep uh, out in the pasture fighting off lions and bears uh, than he was because when he got involved in leadership and when all of a sudden, you know, King Saul's going after him and his life changes and, and all of a sudden he has haters in his life. Like he always has like some slander or persecutor or hater in his life when you look at him. Just read Psalms. It's like they're always present. Always present. Ver, uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16. Let's do that one here. Uh, do not stand idly when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. It's an interesting verse. I did a little research on this. Like, what's the don't here? And, and uh, most scholars believe this. Here, here's what it is. Don't be silent when you should speak up. Don't be silent when you should speak up. So um, it's that situation where you're being, you know, pummeled by someone. And there you have a friend with you there. Your rocks are being thrown at you, and you have a friend. You're being assaulted by someone, a verbal assault, and they're right there. And, and they're, they're in that meeting right there, and, and your integrity is being questioned. But your friend is around the table, and they say nothing. They're silent. And then when it's done, they come to you privately and they say, hey, I just want you to know, you know I'm with you, right? 
I just want you to know, you know, I believe you, right? You know what you want to say to that person? Coward. I needed you when the rocks were being thrown at me. When, all the, when I was in the firing range, I needed you to speak up there. This is easy. In Leviticus, the word of God says, don't, don't, don't stand idly when your neighbor's life is threatened. Here's the other, the other thing here, verse 17, the other don't. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. There it is. Don't nurse hatred. Say it with me. Don't nurse hatred. I think about a baby that's being nursed. So much attention. It's all about that baby, isn't it? They're pretty self-centered if you think about it early on. And it's all about, it's what it should be. Uh, it's all about giving them the proper nutrients and that kind of thing. And, and you think about your whole schedule is changed. Those of you who are in that season of life, you know what I mean? Your whole schedule is changed. They don't care about you sleeping They don't care about what you have to do. They don't care about your work. They don't care about anything. Your agenda doesn't mean anything. When I'm hungry, feed me, right? So that's the way it should be. And then I thought, what does it look like to nurse hatred? You know what that looks like? That's talking about it with others over and over. That's holding it in. That's carrying it with you. It takes a lot of work to nurse hatred. It's not giving it to God. It's holding on to it instead. And you talk about it, you carry it, you keep it alive. The second half of this verse says this, confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. And then I thought, you know, confront people directly? I know, let's be honest, most of the time, we don't want to do that, do we? We don't want to do that. Maybe we don't know how. Maybe we think, oh, if I confront them, it's, maybe it's just frightening for you. But it's biblical. I want you to say, it's, I want to say this, it's possible to confront someone without being confrontational. It might take a little practice, but if the love of God is living in you, it'll be more natural. You can approach someone with love and respect. It's possible. And you ask questions. It's not accusatory time. You did this, and you did this, and you did this. It's help me understand this. Help me understand this. Help me understand this. It can just be questions. Not getting angry or any of those things. But scripture says that's what a healthy relationship looks like. You know that, right? That's what a healthy relationship, like we got to have conversation about stuff. Well, why, why did you say that? And is there something else going on right now? And, and, and uh, I just want you to be aware um, that that hurt me. I didn't know how to take that. Um, verse, it got really quiet. I felt like right there. That just got, maybe it hit a nerve or something. Uh, verse 18, do not seek revenge. Let's say it out loud. So uh, the idea behind this word right here is um, it's about this idea of vengeance belongs to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to God. Now there's an important um, God is described in many ways in Scripture, and one of the ways he's described is he is judge. The character of God. He's the God who never sleeps, never slumbers. He's the God who sees everything. He's the God who hears everything. He's the God who searches the earth for anyone who is righteous, anyone who seeks him. He is all present. These are things that are hard for us as humans to get our head around. He's all present. He's everywhere. He's all knowing. He's also the God who knows our thoughts. He knows our intents, our motives. He knows everything going on in here. 
And it's so beautiful. That's why when you look at uh, the Sermon on the Mount and, and you see Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, you've heard it was said, do not murder. But I say, if you look at a brother in anger, Jesus, over and over, if you look at those but I says, he's going to the heart and to the head. He's not going to the action. Just look at them. I say, if you lust. You, you see that? So I want you to hear this. God is obsessive, um, concerned, passionate, interested in what's happening inside of you. Because if he can take over inside of you, all of those decisions that you make on the outside are easier. If, if, if you get a new heart and he does a little transplant and he takes away the heart of stone and he gives you a heart of flesh, guess what? It's easier to forgive others. It's harder to carry grudges. It's harder to do all that. Uh, the only hard part is when you have a hard heart and you're trying to do the right things. Or if you're not a Christian and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, but you're trying to do the right things. I mean, that's, that's hard. That's frustrating. So I want to say all that to say God is the ultimate judge. And God sees everything. And you don't have to worry about getting back, paying back, scheming, revenge, any of that stuff. When you've been wronged, you can be confident that God knows that person. He sees that person. He's going to work everything out for his glory. Everything. And he cares about that soul. He's so redemptive. He's so redemptive. So redemptive. Glory to God. I'm grateful. Aren't you glad God is redemptive? Aren't you glad God is redemptive? I think about the Apostle Paul. This is a guy who, you know, a good portion of his life was trying to kill Christians. He was a Christian killer. And I think every Christian would have been okay if that dude was taken out by Guido or whoever. I, I think every Christian would have been okay if he had an accident and his car went off on a ditch and he died. But you know what God did? No, 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 no. I'm going to save him and transform him, and he's going to become one of the greatest missionaries of all time. You see how God works? We write off people. God says, oh, see, there's that other side to this whole thing. <clears throat> Those who love much have been forgiven much. Those who love much. I'm preaching today. I didn't preach like this last night. I'm just telling you, God is taking control here. Glory to God. Those who love much have been forgiven much. So I say all that to say, God is a judge. David got it. You know, his nemesis, you know, King Saul was after him. And King Saul was like, I don't know. He was all over the place. He was hot and cold. He was singing David's praises, and then he was throwing a spear at him, trying to kill him. I mean, David's life was turned upside down. He had to leave home and leave his family, and he's running around in the wilderness all because of this dude. But David understood King Saul was God's anointed. And First Samuel chapter 26, he says, no, David said, don't kill him. Related to Saul. For who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? I've patterned my life after this. Um, not, not put, I mean, I, I recognize um, I'm anointed by God, by his grace, and God uses me all the time. But what I, I'm talking about is I've been hurt by servants of God. I've been hurt by other pastors. I've been hurt by leaders of pastors. I've been hurt by pastors that I didn't expect would do that to me. I've been hurt, but every time, and I, it's just a handful of times, but when it's happened, you know what I recall also what I think about? He is God's anointed. And God's going to take care of him. God's going to take care of him. Yeah, you recognize... Um, pastors have a huge weight of accountability before God. Huge weight. 
And we're accountable. That's why Paul says, if, you know, don't be a pastor. Don't be a pastor. <laughs> because there's a weight of accountability that we live with. All right, let's go on. Verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. There it is. Don't bear a grudge. Can you say that with me? Don't bear a grudge. Holding a grudge damages your soul. Holding a grudge hurts you more than them. You hear that? Holding a grudge is poison to your soul. It affects your capacity to love and trust other people. Don't hold a grudge. Don't hold a grudge. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm going to jump to Ephesians chapter 4. We're about to jump pretty high. You know what? I'm going to read Hebrews real quick. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. And the writer of Hebrews is talking about carrying a grudge. He's talking about, you know what? Bitterness is so strong. You think no harm, no foul. I'm going to carry a grudge. But it creates this bitterness. And, and the writer of Hebrews is saying it's a poisonous root that affect your life and can actually corrupt you. Have you ever run across someone who's just angry? They're jaded, angry. They don't go to church. They don't talk to people. They're just angry people. It started off with a poisonous, bitter root. And Ephesians 4, 31, here we go. To get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, oh, wait, let's say get rid. Let me just, let's just say get rid of it together. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. I'll go back to 31. I'm sorry I'm messing with you, man. Uh, but 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger. It's just a mouthful. Harsh words. Oh, there it is again. And... Slander, there it is, as well as all types of what? So all of these are types of evil behavior. Evil. Evil. Bitterness and rage and anger, harsh words and slander, just, just get rid of it. You need God to help you with that. All right, let's go to instead now. Instead, let's read this out loud because it's so cool. Be kind to each other tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as. There it is. Aren't you glad for the grace of God? You need to hear this. God will take care of it. It's not your fight. Let it roll off your back. You give it to God. Don't let the devil steal the joy out of your life. Don't let the devil steal the moment out of your life. God's working right in front of you. We have a God of new beginnings. I love 1 John chapter 4. We can't read it all because of time, but I want to read verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us. If we love each other, God lives in us. If we love each other, God lives in us. In us. If we love each other, God lives in us, and His love is brought to full expression in us. This full expression in us phrase, you can look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 46, where Jesus says, You're to be perfect, for my Father in heaven is perfect. That word means complete, it means mature. It means full grown. And there's this idea of allowing the love of God to transform your life to a certain level where that love inside of you becomes complete. And you're now able to love the Grinches, those who've hurt you, those who've offended you. You're now able to love them with a new prism, a new perspective of what it means to love because that love has grown inside of you. Does that make sense? And it's about your relationship with Jesus. But this, this verse says, oh, put it back up, will you, Megan? Uh, this verse says, uh, um, this verse says, this verse says, we love each other, uh, but if we love each other, God lives in us. 
So there's this thought. Because God lives in us, he's going to take care of me. Because God lives in us, he's going to make sure I'm not going to drown because of the waters. Because God lives in us, he's going to make sure the fire does not burn me. Because God lives in us, he's going to make sure that lion is not going to devour me. Because God lives inside of me, he can create water out of a rock. Because God lives inside of me, I can kill 200 Philistines with the jawbone of an axe. Because God lives inside of me, I don't have to worry about anything. Because God lives in me, he will give me new strength because God lives in me he will encourage me because God lives in me he will carry me because God lives in me God has my back and I don't have to worry about being wrong because God lives in me God will take care of that person who wronged me because God lives in me I don't have to be in anxiety or I don't have to worry I don't have to have any cares of this world because God lives of me I can just make sure that I'm walking with God and he loves me because God lives in me is there anybody put your hands together if you agree with that because God lives in me I don't have to worry about anything glory to God well Merry Christmas baby Merry Christmas Jesus thank you thank you for your word I thank you for the way you got a hold of this service Holy Spirit, thank you. I thank you for answering my prayer. You're so good. You overwhelm me, God. You crush me. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. If you're ready to turn to Jesus right now, that's your first step. You're not a Christian. You can say this prayer say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for all of my sins. Get behind the steering wheel of my life. I'm yours. Others of you, maybe you've slandered. Maybe you've carried grudges. Maybe you've nursed hatred. Maybe you've done other things. You need to say, God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. And give me the strength also to ask for forgiveness from that person who I've hurt. I'm not going to nurse hatred anymore. I'm not going to let the devil have his way in my heart anymore. So right now, I rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. And God, I give you all of those evil things. And I say, get rid of them for me, Lord. Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, put our hands together. Thank God for his word. Let's stand up.